All righty, and my guest today, all the way from Japan, it's Mr. Josh Hawkinson. How you doing, man? How's it going? Doing really well. Very excited to have you. It's a long time coming. Uh, we were just talking about you getting adjusted over to Japan. Uh, yeah. Just like first getting adjusted a day and night. Like, how do you do that? What is it like? Uh, I mean, well, first of all, I had to deal with a little bit with the jet lag. Um, it's a 16 hour difference. So we're 16 hours ahead of um, in Seattle. So just uh, the first, you know, two days are always a little bit rough because try to fight the urge to, you know, not sleep all day and get adjusted to the new schedule. So that's been, uh, that's like the first challenge. And then from there, just trying to stay busy, stay active in the 14 day quarantine, do as much as you can, you know, without driving yourself crazy. <laughs> Man, that's, that's gotta be weird. It's gotta be really weird. Um, what what was the flight over like? What was the airport like? Is it slow? Um, like U.S. compared to Japan, was there a big difference? Um, so normally I just fly uh, Seattle to Tokyo and then fly Tokyo to wherever uh, whatever team I'm going to. So I played all four years here um, in Japan. It's been my fourth year, but this time I had to uh, kind of had some problems getting in just because they're not letting certain people in if they left before uh went back to america before a certain date and you also need your visa which a lot of teams um are people they're not letting people renew it unless they you know had it rolled over the previous year so if you hadn't been to japan before they're not they're making it really hard for people to get in basically but so i flew from seattle to vancouver had a layover in vancouver I was in the international terminal and there was like, it was really weird. It was, there's not a soul in the international terminal. There's only like five flights flying out that day to, you know, just random, random, uh, random cities. And only one was flying out to Japan the entire day. And I was on that flight. I was the only American on, on board. It was, uh, probably less than a third full. I had like the full row to myself, <laughs> so it wasn't bad at all. And then when we got to, um, when I got to Tokyo, I had to take a uh, uh, COVID test, a little saliva test, and then I had to present all my documents, make sure my visa was valid, um, re-entry permit uh, that you have to get from the, the consulate that I got in from the consulate general in Seattle, Japanese consulate general. And then once they cleared everything and showed your test was negative, you weren't allowed to use public transportation, so you have to get a private car to pick you up. So my team is in Nagano, so they had to pick me up um, from there, which is about a three and a half, four hour drive. So after I got on the, off the flight, had to wait for a couple hours for my tests, everything get approved, then get on the four hour uh, uh, little taxi to my city, and and I made it. But yeah. <laughs> long process wow that's uh it's so interesting and just you know thinking about like if someone would have told you when you were in high school that you would be playing four years in japan like what thing what kind of stereotype would you have gotten wrong like what have you been like totally off base about um yeah i mean i never would have imagined that i'd be playing in japan i mean i always thought my, both my parents played in Europe overseas professionally after uh, they were done playing in college. So I kind of thought I was going to go like the Europe route, but then just talking with my agent and seeing, you know, like the best fit for me and, you know, how the league works. It's primarily a, a big man league. So they have a lot of really good Japanese guards, but they lack, you know, like size and um, skill at the, you know, power forward and center position. So they bring in mostly Americans that are, you know, over six, seven ish. So, um, I guess the one stereotype, I guess maybe the food. I mean, I knew they had like, you know, ramen and sushi and like that type of things, but I didn't know like the depth of like how good Japanese food is like all around. Like mm -hmm. there's just so many good different types of foods. Um, it's actually probably my favorite, uh, my favorite type of food is Japanese food. I, I would have to say that just, mm. it's just so broad how many different ways they can go and they're so good at preparing so many different things. So 
Yeah, what's your favorite dish? Describe it to me. Let's see the favorite thing. Well, obviously ramen and sushi are our top tier. Okay, I love okay. Every Tuesday I go to, um, well, in the past, I can't for the next two weeks, but uh, in the past, every Tuesday I went to, they have a uh, hundred yen sushi and it's like the conveyor belt or whatever. And you get two pieces for a hundred yen and basically a hundred yen is a dollar. So you get two pieces for a dollar and there's just a bunch of, you know, stuff going around and then you can order it but yeah really good bang for your buck and it's really good sushi um and then i love the the wagyu beef that's what some of the best uh, beef in the world really good and the kobe kobe beef too um they have really good fried chicken called karage uh that's really good um and then I also like this. This makes it a little weird, but I'm a fan of takoyaki, which is like, imagine like uh, I don't know how to explain it. It's like pancake batter, and then they put in like garlic and then uh, sliced up octopus. Dang. <laughs> okay. This looks like a like a pancake batter ball with like little chunks of octopus in there, and then they put this like uh, like little sweet glaze over the top. Uh huh. It's really good. I'm a fan of that too. So, were you always adventurous when you were eating? Like even when you were growing up and stuff? Uh, yeah, I like a lot of different types of foods. My parents never really, I didn't eat much vegetables and stuff like that. But I was always, you know, into whatever I could eat, anything basically. So, not none of that stuff really fazed me. Mm. I, I blame growing up in Kansas and only having uh, access to fish sticks. And then uh, yeah. eating a lot of hamburger helper, things like that. So yeah. sushi, I, I can't do even most seafood. Like I'm the worst about. So really? um, I don't know if jumping right to Japan would be a, a good good thing or a bad <laughs> thing. The fried chicken sounds great, though. Uh, yeah, fried chicken and a lot of good noodle stuff so that you probably enjoy. Yeah, ramen, uh, absolutely. Um, but kind of taking it back to the beginning, um, you mentioned both your parents played college ball. Um, your yeah. mom played at UW. Uh, so like, what do you remember about being introduced to basketball and falling in love with it? And then, you know, as it evolved to becoming more serious and now being your job? Uh, well, yeah, basketball was always, you know, kind of sprung on me at a young, young age. Uh, I have obviously got the bloodlines for it with both my parents playing professionally. Um, my mom was my first coach when I was like four. So my first word was like ball. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was destined to be. Uh, and then like growing up, um, living in Seattle, my mom going to UW, I was like a pretty big Husky fan. And I'd always go to, she'd have uh, like, they have alumni games every year and that was one of the highlights is going to watch her play again. Cause I never got, obviously got to see her play when I was uh, younger. So watching her play against like, uh, you know, some of the other good UW former players, that was fun to see. Um, holding her own. Was she holding her own? She was doing good. I used to, <laughs> I remember <laughs> I had a story. Uh, I used to keep her stats. Right. But like, there's so many people that are out there that you can only play a certain amount of minutes. Right. So, uh, I had just got introduced to like, like double doubles, triple doubles, like the concept of that. <laughs> and I told my mom, my, my mom had like six points, like two steals and like a rebound. And I was like, mom, you got a triple single. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, wow. Like, <laughs> I, I did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah who would have guessed you would have uh you know have your names all over the record books with the uh, with that so that is hilarious um yeah so and then from there just like they kind of instilled in me like what it's the, what it takes just to be you know a college player and a professional athlete so you know just learning from them i got a lot of good information that maybe a lot of other people wouldn't have wouldn't have had um so they were always there for me, helping me <clears throat> shooting, you know, rebounding for me, that type of thing. So they kind of gave me the blueprint as to how to succeed, um, hmm. to be a college player and then now being a professional. And a lot of those things is probably like a lot of the structure of it and taking it serious and putting in the time. But is there any other things that you can share to, to people that maybe don't have that situation that are growing up now? 
Uh, I mean, yeah, like, for example, like my dad, um, <laughs> he used to be like, oh, we got to get up in the morning, like get, get us shots. We got to go run on the track, like do this extra stuff. But like, I mean, there's only a certain amount of stuff that your parents can say to you and stuff. At the end of the day, it comes down to if you want it, it's your, it's your own dream. So, um, you have to be the one to take that initiative and they can, you know, kind of help you along the way, but it's your journey at the end of the day. So, um, I would say like having them be as like the backbone for me was extremely important because I kind of knew like what, what needed to happen in order for me to, you know, play high level D one and then play professionally. So, uh, I was at kind of an advantage for that, but also like at the end of the day, like you got to be the one that puts in the work on your own. Um, there's gonna be a lot of nights and uh, early mornings just by yourself, working on your game, doing what you got to do, do to um, <clears throat> just get better. And so, yeah. And having your parents be heavily involved in basketball and that, um, you know, be a part of your life at a young age and then taking it serious and taking it to the level you have, um, playing professionally now, like you said, it's a lot of hours that are put in and yeah. that's not always fun. And it, like, so how is, how has that been over your life? Have you ever felt, you know, like, I don't want to do this. I've never felt pressured in, obviously you're doing great now. You've always had, um, great production on the court, but how has yeah. your like relationship with the game changed and evolved over the years uh i mean i think i've always loved basketball it was always uh, like my favorite sport but i grew up playing basketball and baseball i think growing up i was a lot better at baseball because i was you know kind of uh lanky and a little uncoordinated so <laughs> i was a pitcher playing baseball so um growing up you didn't it, it took like less coordination to just throw a ball than to you know, run up and down the court and, you know, use your skill at, at a big, a big height and weight. So, um, I think baseball came easier for me, but I just love like fell in love with the game of basketball and basically just, just putting in the work. And like, for example, like right now, um, when everyone's in quarantine, that's like, I think going to be a big, big thing to see like where everyone's at because, like for a lot of people, it's, um, you know, posting like the stuff on Instagram or everyone's taking videos, like the workouts and everything <laughs> and stuff like that. But then like during this quarantine process, like you can't like no one's like surrounded by that. So you just by yourself, you're grinding. So I think you're going to see a lot of people how they like what they've been doing. You can tell for sure if who is putting in the work and who hasn't based on, you know, what the production is going to be this upcoming year and for years to come just and they're not in like the spotlight they're just by themselves so you're gonna see who the real workers are basically yeah it's all grind no no flex right now uh <laughs> <laughs> when do you think you started taking basketball more seriously when it was you know you're just a kid playing and learning about the game and having fun to being like all right this is something i might want to do with the rest of my life uh i think when i was in high school um, I was, like I said, I played baseball and basketball and, uh, I was like, like I said, I was better at baseball, but then I ended up hurting my, my elbow, my junior year. And I was basically faced with a decision. I either could have surgery on my elbow and, um, not be able to play that summer AAU, which is like the biggest summer, the junior junior summer AAU is probably the biggest on the circuit, just in terms of getting looks for basketball. Or I could rehab my elbow enough to where I wouldn't be able to play baseball, but um, I could still play basketball. And I chose to do that, which was a really tough decision for me because that means that I meant I would have to give up playing baseball. But I know everyone's kind of faced with those tough decisions. So once I stopped playing baseball and I was able to focus hundred percent on basketball, that was really when I saw like my biggest growth and improvement. Um, and then I would say also my freshman year at Wazoo when like I hardly played at all, that was, I think when I kind of got the most better just cause 
it was tough for me. It was a tough situation because I knew I wasn't going to be playing like a lot of minutes. But when you come from being like the best player in high school and then you go into college and you go to like a major, like a, a, a D1, big five uh, power conference, there's just a huge like discrepancy between a the style of play, um, what you think is going to happen versus what actually happens. And um, just like, the level of athleticism and strength and just ability of these players are just so much better than high school. So it's not that I had like unrealistic expectations, but I was kind of put a lot of pressure on myself, I think my first year. So when I didn't play, I kind of like translated to me getting down on myself and started doubting myself a little bit. And so, but when I wasn't playing me and my, my best friend, Ike uh, was the point guard. We just kept getting in the gym because we weren't playing. So we would, you know, we would have our game and we wouldn't play or he'd play more than me. But we get in and go into the practice gym like after the game just because we didn't get the work in during the game, basically. So those are, I think, the two years where I really improved the most going from my um, junior to senior year of high school and my freshman to sophomore year of college. And adjusting from high school to college, like you're in a totally different scenario, like you talked about, um, how much of it is like a mental thing of adjusting? And then like, what was the turning point? Was it, you know, practicing with Ike and, you know, putting those hours in and just doing that? Or was there anything in particular that you did to like speed up that process? Um, well, like my freshman year, it was a little bit different because, like I was, I wanted to play. So I was willing to do what, like the coach, whatever the coach said in order for me to play. And Ken, coach Ken Bone was the one who recruited me at Wazoo. And he told me he wanted me to be like an Aaron Baines type. Right. So he wanted me to be like, you know, 265, 270. But I came in at like 225, 230. And like, I've always been like, I'm not like a banger, but I can play inside and out. Like I can, I like to shoot threes and, you know, mid range, but I can post up too. So when he said for me to start playing like only like inside and just bang and get rebounds and stuff, I was like, I'll do that. Like, cause I want to get minutes. So my first, my freshman year, I put on like 35 pounds. I got up to like 270 and in a matter of like, five months or something like four or five months and it was just not good weight for me <laughs> like, I just, like my body just hurt running up and down the floor I wasn't playing um and then just like I couldn't run I couldn't move very well so it was just difficult for me so I was kind of out of my comfort zone a little bit there and then I mean I obviously kept like working and trying to get better but then when uh, Coach Kent came in my sophomore year, he like sat me down and had a meeting. And he was like, "Well, what do you think you can bring to the like bring to the team? Like, what's your role going to be?" And I was like, "I mean, I'm 270. I can bang and rebound because that's what Coach Coach Bone told me to do." And he's like, "Nah, nah, nah. That's not what you're going to do. You're going to score. You're going to rebound. We're going to get out and we're going to run." I was like, all right, that sounds like a lot more fun. <laughs> but then I had to go back and lose that 35 pounds that I had just gained. So I was, uh, it wasn't actually as hard as gaining the 35 pounds just because I felt a lot more comfortable at around like 235, 240. So just, I think putting the work in and then also just being ready for the opportunity when it's given to you is a huge thing. Cause I mean, I know a lot of people don't get those opportunities like, like I did just kind of sprung up on them. So yeah, I know you just got to continue to put the work in and um, just trust that um, an opportunity is going to be given to you. And when it is, you really have to fully take advantage of it. And, and playing at Wazoo, uh, you had the honor of sweeping the Huskies Uh what can, what can you say about that rivalry being a player? Cause I've experienced it living in the U district and uh, just yeah. being all around that. So from your side, you know, what is it like coming to Mont Lake? What is it like when, you know, the Huskies come to your side? Yeah. Oh man. I, I love my favorite place to play was at UW. 
I feel like every Seattle kid who doesn't get recruited from UW always goes off when they play at UW. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I'm pretty sure Tucker Heyman, he, he went off when Western Michigan played at, at UW. So, uh, even, uh, like this past, this past year, uh, when the Cougs, I think we swept them again this past year. Yeah. All the Seattle games like CJ and, um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. So I think playing in heck ed was my favorite place to play in like, you know, all of the Pac-12 just cause, you know, just they kind of overlooked me and you kind of have a little chip on your shoulder being so close to Seattle and to UW and like, you know, why didn't they recruit me and things like that. So you always play a little bit harder in those games. And I think I like did the math and I think I averaged the most points and most rebounds against UW than any other team. And the fact that I wouldn't have played. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just love it. And all my friends and family were there. So, you know, you always get to see them after the game and you can hear, there's always a pretty good Coog section in, uh, in Hecate that makes their way there. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a great rivalry and I just love being a part of it. That's awesome. Uh, is it ever hard to balance that energy? That's gotta be a lot, you know, when the crowd is one way or another putting energy into you, whether it's positive or negative. Uh, yeah. Is it ever too much? I feel like as a big man, you know, me not being a big man, I feel like it would be less so on you than like a guard, but you know, I'm not there. Yeah. I mean, I think guards, they control the ball a lot more. So you're the big man are more, um, at the will of the guards passing the ball a little bit. So for the guards, they might be a little more pressure and have that type of um, energy affect them a little more. But I always kind of fed off the energy. I think my favorite game was the senior night game when we played UW and we won that game and to sweep them that year, my senior year. And I had like, I think I had like, 70 to 75 uh friends and family my mom made like t-shirts with like my face on them and stuff like that uh my sister sang the national anthem at the game wow. ike dragged my dad into the <laughs> the, the pre-game uh huddle like circle dance circle my dad was like <laughs> waiting for the towel like going crazy dancing um we had a ton of fans at the game everyone was super hype and i think i hit a three with like two minutes to go. And that was like the most excited I've ever been in the game. <laughs> I just wanted to win that one so bad just because there were so many people there behind me. And it was the kind of the culmination of my four years. That's awesome. And you were a great rebounder, obviously. Uh, just while I have you, like what, what makes you a great rebounder? Obviously a lot of it's size and positioning and uh, timing and things like that. But um like, was there, again, like a turning point for you where you're like, okay, I really got this figured out? Um, I mean, yeah, like I'm not the, definitely not the most athletic guy. Um, I'm not, I don't really have a high vertical or things like that. But I think rebounding does get overlooked a lot. And um, so I had a coach at Wazoo and he was basically said like, don't ever let a guard steal your rebound. Like they get their points, they get their assists, like rebounds are your gold. That's what you need to do to, you know, to get your stats up basically. And so I was, I fully embraced that. I was like, all right, so I'm just going to start going after every single rebound. And um, it just came to the point where I took a, I took a lot of pride in getting a lot of rebounds and, you know, trying to get at least, 10 per game. That was my, that was my goal to get 10 or 11 every single game. And then I pretty much, if you get in the rebounds, you're going to get two or three offensive rebounds that are going to lead to, you know, maybe four to six points a game off of, uh, you know, just putbacks and then running the floor is another four to six. And then, you know, scoring the half court is another four to six. That's just an easy, you know, like 16, 15, 16 a game that you can get pretty much just by kind of working hard. So uh, that was probably the thing. I think my freshman year, we had a guy on our team named DJ Shelton, and he would always try to get all the rebounds too. And then he left, so I was like, all right, I got to take his place. I got to get all the rebounds. <laughs> <laughs> you make it sound so easy and so logical. I could, uh, could totally do that. Uh, so you were the 2017 Pac-12 Scholar of the Year. As I was doing research, I saw that. 
Um, and as we move off Wazoo, uh, just what advice would you have to players who struggle in the classroom? You know, it's not, not always easy. I, I was one of those people who was yeah. not always the best in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I think it's just such a important part and it's very, you can translate it very easily to basketball. Um, at least it came a little bit easier for me because I had like both my parents there. They were working with me and trying to help me and stuff like that. And I know a lot of kids don't have that same opportunity. So I was, you know, kind of blessed to grow up in an environment like that. But um, like for me, I think basketball and kind of academics just went hand in hand just because I think when you're able to understand like certain concepts in school and stuff like that, I think you can see the parallels in, in basketball, just things like, you know, um, listening, following directions, um, making simple reads, things like that. Um, and just hard work. A lot of it is just putting the time in and making an effort. Um, for a lot of kids, I know they might give up pretty easily. So, anything in life you're going to need to put the work in in order to find success. And so just continue to be diligent and not give up. And that's a big part of about school. If your teachers see that you're, you're trying and trying to um, get better every single day, they're not going to, they're not going to fail you. They're not going to, they're going to try and work to, to help you get better. So I think that's one of the things, just try not to give up and be, be diligent. We, we talked a little bit about Japan earlier, but there's a lot to dissect there. And uh, just what do you remember? You know, you um, finish up your career at Wazoo. Uh, you kind of learn, obviously, you know, Europe versus um, Asia and then find yourself uh, going to Japan. Yeah. What do you remember about like, <laughs> you know, the car ride to the airport, the flight over, like first time going? And were you did you fly over on your own? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm on. Um, uh, my parents dropped me off at the airport. They were, they were, uh, you know, like sad, obviously and like crying and stuff, but yeah, I was sad too. I was like, man, what am I getting myself into? <laughs> that the thing. Um, and then I got to Japan and I remember the first, first three months i absolutely hated it i was super homesick i didn't have any friends no one spoke english uh and so it was just a tough situation for me at first as is you know for a lot of people i think their first year especially their first couple months just getting used to it and getting adjusted to the routine to the schedule to the culture to whatever you know place they're at it's difficult, but after those three months, four months, I just began to fall in love with it. And I absolutely love Japan, love the people, love the culture, the food and everything about it. So I think the more you can dive in and just explore, try to learn the language a little bit, um, just try to be as much like the culture um, and embrace it as much as you can, wherever you're at. Cause I think you can get a sense of, how they live and then you can kind of blend the two of how you live versus how they live and kind of find a happy medium where you fit and can feel comfortable in there. And how are you accepted? Like I just picture you, you know, you're a bigger guy. You're going to stand out a little bit. And then, um, did that help? Did that hurt? Uh, how are you like accepted just on your general day to day interaction on the street with people? uh japanese people are like awesome they will seriously go out of their way like to help you even if like like for the first year i couldn't speak any japanese so i was trying to like pull up google translate or like use you know do like pictionary or use my hands play charades with them trying to explain (laughs) (laughs) but uh yeah I, i did that a lot my first year and they worked with me a ton just trying to figure out what I needed and they will just seriously go out of their way to help you. So I was very grateful in that aspect. And then like when I walk on the street and stuff, they'll, they'll always like stop you, ask for pictures and stuff like that. Cause they don't see people that are, you know, six ten and white. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I, I do get that a lot. I bet. I bet. Uh, is there any Japanese custom that you've picked up 
uh, that you think he'll have with you for the rest of your life? Oh, it's kind of funny. Uh, like when I see like bowing is like super, it's not like a full bow, but just like a, you know, like a little like head, like head tilt or whatever. And I noticed when I went back to America, I would start like bowing when I see people. I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> like, like a normal, like, you know, like a, like a, like a head nod. You're like, what's up? Like that. I'd be like, I'd be like this, you know, just a little bow or whatever. I'm like, man, what am I doing? I don't know why I'm doing that. It's just like a force of habit. I don't know. <laughs> mm. And, uh, thinking about basketball, how would you say the camaraderie is similar and then different, you know, to like your college experience? Uh, so in Japan, this every year, the rules have changed a little bit regarding like the, um, imports. So that dynamic is a little bit different, obviously, because when you're out there with your Japanese teammates, most of them don't speak English. So when you're on the floor together, it's kind of hard to communicate what you want um, or in depth. I can kind of explain like like little things that I'm trying to tell them. But if I'm trying to say like, all right, I'm going to set this ball screen, I'm going to slip, <laughs> pass it to me, and I'll find the guy in the corner and we're going to get a three. Yeah, that, that's there's no way that's going to happen. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that part of the dynamic of just, the communication while you're on the court is a little bit hard. Um, when you're like on the side, luckily I'm on a team now that has a uh, coach that he's half uh, American, half Japanese. So he speaks English. So the last three years I had a fully Japanese coach, so he didn't speak any English. So we had the translator there translating mm -hmm. to us what he's saying and stuff like that. So that's kind of a little bit of a weird dynamic because sometimes stuff does get a little like lost in translation, uh, especially like if it's a quick timeout, like a 30 second timeout and they're trying to tell you something. And then the translator is like lost a little bit. And then they tell you something and then you go up there and do something wrong. And then the coach comes there and yells at you. It's like, man, come on. You just set me up, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Cut me a little bit of slack here. <laughs> right. uh, and uh, you're still living uh, the double, double life uh, overseas how would you say your your game has changed at all uh like style of play you know you probably have to adjust um since you've been overseas uh i think i've just gradually started to play more and more like on the outside handling the ball like getting the rebound and pushing it by myself uh i think that's the thing that i've tried to improve on the most just trying to be uh more of a big guard, I guess, is what they call it. <laughs> so, just uh, increasing my shooting range, my ball handling, just to be able to play like on the wing a little bit more, driving more. Um, so those are the things I've been I've been working on a lot, pretty much. Hmm. Is there any politics around like you no know, work on your post game versus work on your shooting uh, at this point in your career? Uh. I wouldn't say politics, um, but like, for example, we have three Americans on this uh, team that I'm on right now. One's like a seven footer, big guy. Um, he can step out, shoot the three, but he mostly bangs in the post. Mm. And then we have another guy who's a wing, six, seven, who plays uh, mostly on the outside. So you can only play two Americans at a time. So like, for example, when, uh, Wayne, who's the big guy, the five is in. I'm going to be playing more on the wing, um, guarding the wing players. But then when Wayne sits on the bench and uh, a Anthony McHenry's in, he's going to play more on the wing. So then I'm going to have to be playing the, the five. So it's just a little bit of, um, you know, what the mismatch is and who I'm guarding versus who's guarding me. And in terms of whether I'm playing outside or if I'm playing inside. Mm -hmm. And then what is the environment like for the games? Oh, man, it's uh, – so I remember the first game, they're just doing all, like, these chants and uh, all, like, <laughs> crazy stuff. Uh, the fans are, like, sit, like, right super close on the court. Um, so they're, like, super, like, close and personal. And they do, like, the same two chants every single possession – whether it's on offense or defense, they'll do like the defense, 
like that one, but like over and over. And then like we have this little jingle when we're on offense that like the little uh, sound guy will play. And it's like super old, but. (laughs) (laughs) And then um, like after the games, we have have to like, we stay on the court. Everyone has to like give a speech or like the coach gives a speech. Someone else gives a speech. And then like the best player of the game gives a speech. And we have to go like high five all the fans. And then Mm -hmm. after the game, we have the fans all like sit in the lobby and wait for you. And then you have to go out and then like interact with them and take pictures with them and stuff like that. Obviously that's changed a lot with the whole COVID (laughs) COVID Mm -hmm. stuff. And now they're doing like kind of a checkered fan pattern. So like, you know, every like six feet, there's a chair or whatever in a checkered pattern. So I think that's how the league's progressing right now. There've been a lot of preseason games going on that have been utilizing that. I don't know if they're going to ever go back to playing at full capacity for the fans. Uh, but I guess we'll see how how the COVID situation keeps playing out. Right. And you talked about the fans a little bit, but, you know, what are they like? Your interactions with them, uh, you know, can you just describe them a little bit? Uh, I think, like, every team has, like, a couple, like, super fans. They go, like, on the road to every single game. <laughs> Um, there's a couple fans that, uh, were like super big fans of me. So they're always just like screaming my name. And then after the game, it's like, they always give you a ton of gifts, like every single game we play like 70 some games and they give you like, I kind of feel bad cause they spend like a lot of money, just like random gifts, just like food or, uh, some fans have given me custom pro V one golf balls, like with my wow. name and stuff on it. And like I, I like kind of feel bad because I'm like you got you guys are already spending money on the game like you're sitting like courtside basically I know this is, it can't be cheap you know <laughs> and then they're gonna be like buying like like all this stuff for me and I'm like man they're 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 spending too much money I feel bad man <laughs> you're a good guy that's why uh, and then how about the opposing fans what are they like uh I mean it's not like too crazy there'll always be one or two that like. They have like, uh, you know, how Arizona State does like the current distraction. Mm-hmm. They'll have like, like masks and stuff and do like weird stuff. But for the most part, they're like pretty respectful on the other, on the other side, on the other team. Mm-hmm. Um, some, it depends on what team it is. And some teams have bigger fan support than others, obviously. But uh, for the most part, they're pretty respectful because Japanese people are very respectful as a, as a culture. Has anything like that, you know, the, the masks or when you're shooting a free throw, somebody making noise or anything like that, has that ever gotten to you? Uh, no, not really. I remember, oh, I think the craziest thing is one time, uh, a guy, I was shooting a free throw and there was a guy in a full head to toe Ichiro like outfit. He had like the Mariners hat. He had the one Ichiro jersey. He was wearing baseball pants, and baseball cleats. Where do, with, you, like, get, where do you get those pants? I don't know. I really don't know. And it was like like a legit Mariners Ichiro baseball jersey. Wow. He was even wearing like the shades, Ichiro shades. And he was like yelling on the side. And then all of a sudden this dude just passes out. And like he's he's courtside and he just passes out. <laughs> and i think he had like a heart attack or something in the middle no. of the game and we were like the game just stopped i mean that obviously rattled me i was like what is going on but yeah he he ended up being okay so oh good okay <laughs> that, okay that, good. man and to kind of wrap up uh you know fun factor for you playing uh wow. thinking about high school um college and now playing pro in japan Mm -hmm. uh like where does it rank where do you have the most fun uh i think there's nothing comparing like college to like the fun level just because like those are all your boys like you'll always be like my my uh college friends and teammates are going to be like my boys for life basically so i think college would rank number one um High school is up there. I think when you get to like professional, it, it's like, it's your job. So like, I mean, I have fun. I love playing basketball, but 
you know, you don't really have the same memories that you had do with like your high school, especially your college, your college teammates. Cause just like the bond you create over those four years, especially with the guys who came in with you from the beginning, there's literally nothing like that. And you can't replicate that. So I think the college experience in terms of, you know, playing with joy and, and having a lot of fun just can't, can't be matched. And then for you, uh, like, what are you looking for? What are you working towards, uh, like the next five years, next 10 years, uh, uh, throughout your career here? Um, you know, well, the last three years I've played in like the second division, we were one of the best teams in the second division. So I worked up to the, this year I'm playing in the, in the first division. So that was kind of a goal for me, uh, like a mini goal, but just continue to try to be the best basketball player I can be. And, set myself up in the right with the right opportunities that you know if I can make jumps to play somewhere then so be it but I'm I really love Japan as of right now and just trying to you know win a championship obviously with my with my current team so those are kind of the the mini goals but um obviously playing the NBA would would be a would be a dream dream come true but uh I was trying to play in the summer league this, this summer, but obviously that, that uh, went away, but it's okay. You know, just keep working every single day and uh, let the opportunities come when they come. Hmm. The Beatles say there's no place you can be that you're not meant to be. And it seems like, you know, from watching your Instagram stories, you have some really good times and it's an interesting okay. life. And, you know, you're going to be able to write a book one day uh, about, about what oh, you've well, seen yeah. and experiences you've had. Um, First, would you like to say anything um, to the Japanese fans that may have have found this interview and uh, got the translation? And you, I don't know if you can say anything in Japanese to them or or not. But I'll open up the floor uh, to you. I, mean, I, I speak a, a little bit of Japanese, not enough to give a not enough to give a speech. I'm working. <laughs> I'm working to try to get my Japanese better. I'm not like conversational, but I can get my point across if that if that makes sense. But uh, I guess to all the Japanese fans, I got a, I got a new team, so I'm looking forward to uh, to playing uh, this year again, and hopefully bring a championship to the Shinshu Brave Warriors. So I look forward to seeing you guys, and uh, hope for a, a really good year. And the people back home, the, the Seattle basketball community, the people at the pro am who. Uh, Man, missing the pro am this year. Another thing that has uh, COVID has taken from us. So, um, just to the people back home, to the people back home, city of Seattle, I love you. Thank you for uh, raising me. Uh, it's a great basketball culture, and I'm just proud to be a part of it and be one of the the guys who made it to be a pro in uh, in Seattle. And you know, love Seattle. Love you guys. There we go. Boom. And uh, for the people who want more, where can they follow you? I know you are verified. Uh, boom. <laughs> sound effects uh, on that one. Verified on Instagram. Uh, yeah. where, where, can they, where can they find you on there? You can find me on Instagram, jhawk.24. And on Twitter at Josh underscore Hawkinson. If you want to tap in, I got a, a lot of interesting stuff I post about Japan and, and things like that on my, on my stories, as you might have might have seen sometimes you'll get some tiktoks with some some japanese people dancing or you know you never know what you, you'll find if you follow me <laughs> yeah. he's really living that life so go follow him enjoy it and uh i appreciate you coming on today thank you for your time yeah thank you so much appreciate it <laughs>